I am so pleased to be the person introducing Professor Akira Drake Rodriguez to all of you. Uh, I know that many of you know Akira through her teaching here at Penn. Uh, but for those of you who did not know Akira, you're in for a treat. Uh, Akira received her bachelor's degree here at Wharton, her master's in public policy from the Bell School here at Penn, and her PhD at Rutgers in the Department of City, City Planning and Policy. And she returned to Penn a few years ago to join us as a postdoctoral fellow, and very thrilled that she joined us. I guess last year was your first year as an assistant professor. Pandemic year. Tenure track. Hey. <laughs> it feels like you've been here so long, um, which is a good thing. So Akira's research lives at the intersection of race, space, and empowerment. This evening she'll be talking about her book, Diverging Space for Deviance, the Politics of Atlanta's Public Housing. And I completely recommend it. <laughs> I'll loan you my copy, but only if you promise to give it back. Um, and the book flips the typical public housing script. Do you know the one that focuses virtually exclusively on public housing as troubled spaces of concentrated poverty? Instead, Akira uses the concept of black participatory democracy to expand our understanding of these spaces in a way that shines a light on them as spaces of black political engagement. And I have to say, I was kind of embarrassed almost as I was reading it and doing my own work with black women in reentry and realizing the gaps in my knowledge about um, black feminist politics. So I was sourcing, you know, like <laughs> starring the, the source list at the end of Rakira's book and reading up on my, on my gaps. Akira's current work also centers participatory engagement, and I'm sure some of you know about her current work on a project that focuses on Philadelphia schools in gentrifying neighborhoods, exploring the potential of these schools to become sites of positive gentrification. In fact, she was just quoted in the Inquirer over the weekend. That was about yeah. university townhomes, right? Did you know you were quoted? I talked to them, <laughs> but I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, <I was> <laughs> My husband was like, Akira's the paper. <laughs> She's also written a bunch of op-eds, so find those too. And then, of course, last semester, Akira involved our students, maybe some of you, I don't know exactly who took that course, in, um, in that project. So the project will lead not only to academic publications, but also to a series of workshops with parents to teach them about community organizing strategies. And that's one of the things I really admire about you, is your commitment to doing this very rigorous top-level academic research, but also grounding it and making sure that you're giving back to the community. Uh, finally, Akira is an amazing teacher. I've sat in on her classes myself in order to better understand the magic that gets her these amazing course evaluations. <laughs> you know, it's not like cupcakes and coffee, although maybe they're Sometimes. That too. Donuts. Um, and she's the recipient of several prestigious grants, including current grants from the National Science Foundation and the Knight Foundation. So we'll have time for questions following the talk. For now, please join me in welcoming Professor Akira Drake Rodriguez to the stage. Thank you. I know. I know. I know. have like stereo sound. I know, it's cool. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Lisa, for that great introduction. And thanks to all my students and faculty. Hi, Fran. Um, hi, everyone. I'm not being selective, but hi. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming out. Um, I know that it's hard on Monday nights, and um, so I do appreciate you kicking it with me to talk about my book. Um, so I'm just going to jump right into it. Feel free to ask questions. Like, this is, you know, like, it's okay. I'm not, you don't have to wait till the end. Um, but just, I'd much rather it be kind of engaging and interactive than not. Um, so this book comes out of my dissertation um, that I wrote a long time ago. <laughs> I started writing it in 2012, and I finished in like 2017. So it was a labor of love, but mostly hate, um, <laughs> as it is with a five-year project. Uh, but what I was looking at and what originally caught my attention with this story was an article in the New York Times um, talking about the demolition of um, Bowen Homes in Atlanta. Um, the article noted that this was um, a city that was the site of the first um, public housing, Techwood Homes, um, in the U.S., uh, kind of like through the um, New Deal and sort of Public Works Administration's housing division um, initiatives to create public housing in the wake of the foreclosure crisis and the Great Depression. 
Um, and sort of how it was also the first city, Atlanta, to demolish virtually all of its public housing, um, largely through the program known as Hope Six, um, the unironically named housing opportunities for people everywhere, um, that was actually destroying a lot of valuable housing stock. In the wakes of this like 20 year demolition that began um, in preparation of the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta and lasted well into um, the 2010s, you have the foreclosure crisis, you have the beginning of the eviction crisis, so you see kind of the value almost immediately of the loss um, of public housing in Atlanta. Um, in the 1980s, sort of the pinnacle of public housing uh, units in the city, about 10% of Atlanta's population lived in public housing. So it was a very sort of robust um, source of affordable housing, but also, as I hope to show in this presentation, a robust source of um, working class politics. So I look at this sort of 75 year history of public housing in Atlanta. Um, that's largely based on race, right? Race is a central organizing logic. I'm sure most of you know about the segregated origins of public housing. In Atlanta, it looked a little different than it did in a place like Chicago, um, for example, or New York. Um, because of the low population of black residents in Chicago, in the Midwest, in the Northeast, at the time of sort of public housing construction, you sort of see that public housing is creating the segregated geographies that many of us are familiar with in urban planning. In Atlanta, it was much different. Um, as a Confederate and a slave state, the population of black people was much higher. Um, so in Philly, um, New York, for example, at the turn of the 20th century, we're looking at three, five percent of the population is black. In Atlanta, it was 40 percent. And so you have a very sort of diverse and robust black population and public housing is used to sort of sort and create this new racialized geography that is intimately linked to political representation and spatial awareness. I chose public housing because it's a multi-scalar program, right? So it's um, federally funded, state authorized, and so locally administered. Um, and what that means is that there are these um, emerging and shifting political opportunities that can come out of these different levels of policy and of these different spaces of activation. So these are different state targets that can either be friend or foe to the tenant and the tenant association of public housing developments in particular. I also look at this concept of deviance, um, again, centering this largely around race, but then soon around gender, marital status, ability, relationship to the carceral state, really understanding how deviance has something to be cleared, targeted, and removed from the city in order for it to function properly. So, of course, we are familiar, um, and I'm saying, of course, we, because you all were all in my history class, so you know that. <laughs> Um, things such as blight, slum clearance, urban renewal, Negro removal are all intimately linked to what we think the city should get rid of and what it should become. And so public housing politics has a very sort of deep intertwined history with this notion of deviance and sort of creating both new categories of deviance, as in the case of the welfare queen or of the slum inhabitant, um, but also sort of challenging and changing spatial logics to reflect that deviance. I think about that in the case of um, this concept known as sort of diverging space, sort of a geography um, theory that looks at the ways that people sort of transform or reappropriate the space around them to reflect the spatial logics of their everyday or lived life. Um, so I think this is very important in a place with um, um, high levels of abandonment, uh, places that are not servicing the needs of everyone equally, um, spaces of disinvestment, spaces of blight, spaces that are targeted for slum clearance and removal, and really thinking about how people are uh, manipulating those spaces before the widespread government or private sector intervention. So I'll talk about all of these themes um, over the course of the 20th century in Atlanta. Uh, I'd like to start here. Um, Atlanta, um, soon after Baltimore and later even Richmond, Virginia, was one of the cities that really sort of put forth the idea of racial zoning. Um, an urban planner named Robert Witten um, sort of went around in the 1920s 
um, advertising and consulting with different cities to bring about this sort of reorganization of space in the urban center, preferably around things that you all are very familiar with, such as the use of the building, the area that is taking up in the street, the height of the building, but also, as you see um, on the right on the upper um, corner, this idea of racial districts. And if we're thinking about highest and best use, the R1 is implied, but the R2 um, being a colored district, and an R3 undetermined. Um, much of the early targeting in Atlanta for slum clearance and public housing developments, as well as other sort of New Deal um, projects, were around R3 areas, right? So the idea of mixed races very early being eliminated as spaces to develop either white or black housing, again, creating new racial geographies that did not necessarily reflect the existing racial geographies in the city of Atlanta. In 1906, there was also a race riot that really transformed the way the city looked. Um, this was a four-day racial riot that targeted predominantly black areas in the city, particularly around the central business district. So this was, again, a reassertion of white supremacy in the wake of Reconstruction, um, minimizing any sort of political or economic gains of black residents in the city by clearing them out physically, but also politically from the thriving central business district and putting them into largely four or five areas in the city of Atlanta. Um, these sorts of tensions arose largely, as noted, um, in areas around public space, but also the domination of the business sector and the um, growing fear that the growing Black population was going to eventually translate into growing Black political power. In 1890, Atlanta begins what is known as a white primary. In this case, um, Democratic parties, Republican parties, political parties were all private entities. And so they were allowed to discriminate and were allowed to hold racially segregated um, primaries in this case. And so in a predominantly Democratic state and a predominantly Democratic city, um, as you all know from living in Philadelphia, the primaries are king. Um, so the ability to have a white primary is essentially like disenfranchising um, the roughly 33% of um, the black electorate that existed around this time. And so thinking about this sort of multi-scalar political opportunities that I talked about earlier that come out of the public housing program, the New Deal and federal funding provides an opportunity for um, this fairly disenfranchised black community that's spread throughout Atlanta to begin asserting some control over the space that is surrounding them. And so, um, the five black areas in Atlanta were largely disinvested, right? This was the space of landfills. This was the space where there were no sidewalks, no public lighting, um, no early public transit, very sort of disinvested relative to the rest of the city. And so federal funding, and particularly the black elites um, who um, we see even at the federal level known as the Black Kitchen Cabinet, um, Robert Clifton Weaver, who was the first secretary of HUD, um, as well as um, noted black Harvard economist, Charles Foreman, Mary McLeod Bethune, all sort of worked in the New Deal in um, Roosevelt's black kitchen cabinet to create equal political opportunity for black residents during the New Deal. And so we all are familiar with the narrative that the New Deal was racist, right? Um, it excluded Social Security for domestic and agricultural workers. Um, it did not allow things fairly. But in the case of public housing, in the case of other large-scale construction projects, there were people working to make sure that Black labor was prioritized and to make sure that there were some political opportunities and policy benefits for Black communities, particularly in the disenfranchised South. just showing some, um, the white primary lasted up until 1946. And so here is a sort of calling card for the mayor of Atlanta, William B. Hartsfield, one of the longest serving mayors in Atlanta and one of the namesakes of their famous airport. Um, again, this idea that the white primary did not have to care or cater to the black vote, excluding um, black voters, 
who were only eligible to show or able to demonstrate any political power in general or special elections. And so the New Deal um, provides, again, a large-scale transformation of local black space in Atlanta. On the left, we have um, a combination aerial shot of the John Hope and New University homes. These homes were located adjacent to um, the HBCUs in Atlanta, such as Spelman, Morris Brown, Clark Atlanta, et cetera, um, really intentionally cited there under the guidance of John Hope, the first black president of Morehouse College, who wanted um, throughout the 1930s to create affordable housing situated near the strongest institutions for black residents in the city. Part of that institution and a lot of the political opportunities, as you'll soon see, in this early phase of public housing construction accrued largely to the black elite. Um, so here on the right, we have um, Alonzo Marone and the first housing staff. Um, Alonzo is the housing manager for University Homes, the first black public housing development constructed in 1937 in, a, um, in the state of Georgia um, and the second in the nation. And so, Alonzo, who is um, a trained sociologist from Brown, um, a resident and um, citizen of the West Indies, um, comes in and immediately makes an impact at the national level. Um, they develop a housing manager training program for black housing managers at the Atlanta School of Social Work. He travels extensively to other cities, Cleveland, Chicago, where early public housing is being developed. Um, giving advice to other black housing managers on how to assert and obtain greater political opportunity, primarily through um, the issuance of greater black employment in these public housing developments, but also sort of generating a lot of positive press, showing how black people can be good citizens and are deserving of even more public welfare and benefit. The differences between black and white public housing um, in the New Deal era, um, I try to demonstrate that here with these two pamphlets. On the left, um, a pamphlet for John Hope Holmes, um, again, the shot that was shown in the previous slide, um, and Clark Howell Homes, um, an all-white development, both of which are constructed in 1940s. Um, so there are some slight differences between the images, for example, the play space for the white children looks a bit more idyllic than that for the black children. But you'll also notice some differences in the maximum income limits um, to gain entry into public housing. Public housing at its origins was not a housing of last resort. Um, it was the housing of choice for a submerged middle class. And so there were housing minimums, housing maximums, interviews, inspections. Um, it, it, Largely, it is targeted to those, again, who saw the greatest loss um, during the foreclosure crisis in the Great Depression, and not for those who inhibited the slums that were cleared to create these developments. Um, although the um, local advisory committee, who shaped a lot of these programs, who shaped and developed the um, courses that were taught in public housing development in order to Americanize their tenants, um, also set the minimum and maximum income um, and rent limits, understanding the local context in particular. And so although the um, rents and income limits are much lower for Black families, not only does this take into account that there would be two working adults in the black household versus one working adult in the white household, but also noting the severe wage gap and differential between black and white households at the time. In spite of this, um, it was very difficult to feel the larger units um, for four and five families because typically the dollar was not stretching that far. They were not able to generate that much income while also raising um, a larger number of dependents. Um, and so those are the units that typically set idle until the admissions um, and selection requirements changed in the 1950s. Early public housing political opportunity also accrued to those early residents. And so here on the right, we have um, the second uh, man housing manager of University Homes working and talking to Mayor Hartsfield in the center 
showing him some of the private homes that residents were moving into as early as the 1940s. Um, tenants um, giving managers anniversary gifts and celebration, um, as well as, again, a, a photo of that black kitchen cabinet um, from FDR's cabinet. All of these political opportunities and um, show the early alliances in particular between tenants and housing managers. Um, they were all operating from the same class perspective. They all largely shared the same ultimate goals of private home ownership, of greater access and opportunity for black home ownership, but really kind of ignored the realities of those who were on that land before them, right? So not taking into account those who were displaced, um, the ever tightening rental market that emerged, and still the larger structural difficulties of actually securing black private housing relative to the opportunities that whites in public housing had. Race continues to be an organizing logic well after the end of restrictive covenants and the end of racial zoning in 1917, as demonstrated by these land use maps from the 1940s and 1950s. Um, they continue to track race through the 1960s. Um, Atlanta is sort of designated as the city too busy to hate. Um, but in reality, this was a very sort of carefully constructed campaign to minimize racial overflow. And so, of course, these early developments segregated blacks and whites into different areas of the city, but also things such as blockbusting and turnover between black and white neighborhoods were a carefully negotiated process that was done with the assistance of urban renewal funds, um, planning funds, and other sort of um, important jobs such as the housing coordinator for the city. In 1946, the white primary is declared unconstitutional, and we finally start to see some um, voting power emerge for black residents. And one of the first things that they really wanted was the um, black police officer. And so here's a photo of the first eight black police officers appointed in the South. Um, they were appointed in 1948, just a few months before the 1949 primary for the city of Atlanta. Um, and were largely used as sort of tokens for Mayor Hartsfield to secure that black vote. Um, and so they were not allowed to arrest white residents. They were segregated into their own YMCA, um, into their own station, and really had little power. Um, but these were some of the concessions that came in this city that was too busy to hate. Without the sort of venue of direct action and protests that marked a lot of the confrontations in the South at the time, Atlanta's um, most disenfranchised were rarely represented in some of these backdoor deals that appeased the interests of the upper class or the elite, often at the expense of the working class and the working poor. The shift of the um, end of the white primary in 1948 produces a push to change the actual geography of the city of Atlanta. And so, um, as I noted before, due to sort of the um, white primary, the black electorate that was 33% of the city um, could have gained a foothold really quickly in the, by the 1948 election or 49 primary. And so, um, in 1951, Mayor Hartsfield puts forth this idea of a plan of improvement that expands the spatial boundaries of Atlanta by 74 square miles and adds an additional 100,000 residents who are predominantly white in the northern suburbs. Um, so the map sort of goes from those five core areas where black residents are living, surrounding the central business district. Um, this is census data from the 40s and 50s. Um, and then you see the expansion in Atlanta's physical boundaries and the creation and concentration of this Northwest ghetto, where you see a lot of public housing developments emerging and other sort of subsidized um, housing as well. In that um, new Northwest quadrant, you also see a new form of public housing activism and politics. Um, because where um, public housing is being cited in the Northwest, it is a under and undeveloped section of the city. So we're talking no streetlights, no sidewalks, um, no paving of the road, 
um, really sort of shoddily constructed housing with lots of rats, roaches, and other vermin. And so instead of this sort of allied and cooperational relationship between tenants and management that we saw in the 1930s, you see rent strikes, you see direct action, you see occupation, you see explicit calls for the housing authority to do something about the conditions of residents. You also see broader calls happening um, here on the right. Um, Ethel May Matthews, who was not a public housing resident, um, but organized in the spaces of public housing developments, um, calling on the legislature for its responsibility for hunger and poverty. Um, the bottom left, we have Mayor Sanford, president of Terry Homes Tenant Association, a public housing development located in the Northwest, where about 5,000 residents lived, um, 3,500 of whom were children in the 1970s, advocating for that little green spur <laughs> um, that's on the sort of um, transit map, that's MARTA system. Um, Mary Sanford and a lot of women in public housing lived um, in the Northwest and had to take a number of buses all the way down to the Western Terminal at the Blue Line, take that into the city center at Five Points, transfer and go all the way up to Buckhead in order to work as domestic workers um, in those sort of white suburban households. And so they advocated for several decades <laughs> to get that spur that did not even go all the way up to where um, it was in greatest need. And by that point, of course, a lot of that domestic work had ended and a lot of those employment opportunities had dried up. Residents such as Susie Laborde also took advantage of the multi-scalar political opportunities um, that occurred in public housing. Um, Susie Laborde is famous for sort of starting the economic opportunity um, branch in East Atlanta. Um, she was someone who had a very close relationship with President Carter and others, um, using, again, her capacity as a tenant organizer and as sort of an other mother for the wider community to both sort of assess and understand community issues and translate those to people in power, as well as take advantage of the programs and policies that were actually bringing funding into these neighborhoods. And so you start to see the reappropriation of a lot of formerly abandoned space, such as parking lots to turn into um, farmers markets to give away food, um, and reappropriating abandoned homes in the neighborhood to serve as substance abuse centers. In the 1970s, with the end of public housing construction through Nixon's um, construction moratorium, you start to see, again, an even more antagonistic relationship emerge between residents and management. This is an undated list from the early 1970s from the Housing Authority's executive offices, outlining a list of priorities for managers, including this idea of un um, evicting undesirables. Um, and again, very similar to constructions of deviants, beginning with those who inhabited the slums and those who were in blighted communities, the idea of undesirables took on both a social behavioral meaning, but also a political meaning. And so you start to see um, residents who are engaged in more confrontational tactics um, suddenly facing issues around eviction and this appearing in the meeting minutes. In 1974, Atlanta elects its first black mayor, and um, the city has been under black mayoral leadership since then. Maynard Jackson on the right here, um, who was soon followed by Andy Young on the left. Um, and Atlanta becomes known as a black mecca, um, a space where people can go. You are the site of the reverse great migration as people sort of disenfranchised with Northern opportunity um, and failed integration policies, moving into the South, taking advantage of the lower cost of living, um, the more um, community networks that existed there and really creating this um, very prominent and visible black middle class. And so, Thinking about this shift um, in the context of public housing, which is starting its decline because of Nixon's moratorium and the end of a robust federal funding stream, and what that looks like with this black leadership. 
at the national level, the narrative is really changing. Um, public housing is, again, post pruitt Igo in 1972, a site as um, human file cabinets set to explode. At the local level, in the 1980s, you, um, what begins as um, a series of disappearances of black children is soon um, known as the Atlanta child murders, where over 30 um, young adults between the ages of about 10 all the way up to about 28 um, disappeared and were later found murdered. Um, about a third of the victims were found either adjacent to or within public housing developments. And this becomes a real issue um, as it relates to feelings of public safety and public housing tenant solidarity, but also, again, this construction of a narrative of deviance, okay? Um, these children were often not reported missing because people thought they just ran away or were criminals. Um, and then later, once they were found, um, the mothers were quickly blamed for being negligent. And so you see the emergence of a new wave of women organizing outside of the tenant association where they were getting a lot of this negative feedback, um, rallying to stop the child murders and really sort of reclaim the narrative of deviance um, and reclaim um, these victims as the children that they were. Some of that reclamation comes with a push again for public safety in the forms of greater police presence. Um, and so you start to see a push for um, police um, occupying vacant units to either live on site in public housing developments, as well as the um, uh, reappropriation of public housing units into many precincts. Um, at the time, again, because of Nixon's moratorium, there's not a lot of federal funding coming into public housing developments that's not tied to policing. And so you could get addresses and house numbers painted on roofs, but you couldn't get roofs fixed. Um, you could get bars on windows, but you couldn't get new windows. And so um, tenant associations in particular start to make requests for greater policing that also comes with increased level of surveillance. We then see this shift um, uh, because of the units at this point um, that were constructed in the 1930s are quite old. You start to see a shift for selling off public housing um, in the inner city in particular and transforming them into more um, convenient and um, economically viable uses, such as the expansions of the highway or the convention center. An increasing conservative turn um, as noted um, during the Atlanta child murders of um, tenant association leadership. And so a sort of decreasing political opportunity for those who are not elderly, who are single mothers, who are increasingly dependent on welfare emerges. And the tenant association loses a lot of its political advocacy around deviant interest. In 1990, the announcement of the Olympics corresponds pretty well to the map from before of selling off these in-town public housing developments, um, creating a new source of federal funding for local leadership and real estate developers. And so a new sort of regime emerges um, that looks to take away public housing, creating a new, a new slum clearance, and you start to see the development of the HOPE 6 program. Um, this is met with sporadic and not very effective protests. Um, that's actually Ethel May Matthews again. She continued fighting her whole life <laughs> um, for public housing developments. And this was just a, an impossible target. Um, the scales had shifted yet again. Uh, we're now dealing with the IOC, a much more global sort of real estate presence in the city able to sort of transform space and take advantage of the already sort of severed and fractured um, political um, alliances and tenant associations. Um, Hope Six again coming out of this idea that public housing was severely distressed and not intentionally disinvested. Um, I don't have time to get into this, but <laughs> a lot of these transformations were happening under, um, we have this idea of the black urban regime, which is the all black um, leadership, um, both public and private sector. But during the peak of demolitions in Atlanta, 
All of the major institutions were run by black women who are typically the first. Um, so it's Shirley Franklin, the first black woman mayor, um, Beverly Harvard, the first black chief of police, Renee, um, wow, Renee Glover, sorry, <laughs> um, the first black head of the Atlanta Housing Authority, and Beverly Hall, um, the first black woman superintendent of um, the Atlanta Public Schools, all working together um, to facilitate the demolition of public housing, whether it's through increased policing and evictions, whether it's due this privatization um, development scheme, um, or even through collaborations with new forms of schools, such as charter schools. Um, these w Black women sort of all worked as um, interesting foils for the predominantly Black women tenant leadership um, and really sort of challenged these ideas of the Black welfare queen, um, but also sort of reinforced them at the same time in their reasoning. Shout out to Fran. <laughs> I was gonna talk more about demolition as common sense, but I'm gonna skip it. <laughs> but there's a lot of literature that talks about demolition as being progress. Um, this was the original article that caught my eye. Um, and I can talk more about this in the discussion, kind of like what the post-public housing environment looks like, particularly for housing justice and working class politics in the city of Atlanta, whether that's through Occupy Our Homes Atlanta, during the foreclosure crisis, Housing Justice League, currently with the eviction crisis, um, and new sources and spaces of black participatory geographies, um, particularly the clusters, the regional clusters of PTAs, bringing together women who live in shared neighborhoods to talk about their grievances in the way that tenant associations did. Um, things up the street, very similar happening right now, so I'm happy to talk about that as well. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Um, questions? I have a question. I'll start. Sure. I, I'm curious if you could say more. That slide that you put up pretty recently that had all the black women who were heading these. Oh, uh, yeah. First time, mm -hmm. and you know, I'm just trying to. I, I'd love to hear more of the story of their role collectively or separately with the demolition because I can just imagine as being the first in their position that there's that kind of squeeze between maintaining power and you know, serving different, different groups. So. Yeah, um, <laughs> yes. There's definitely a tension that emerges as being like the first black woman. Um, and this is well documented in other sort of like black urban regime literature. Um, and even like Swanstrom's notion of hollow prize that you start to see this rise of black urban leadership in the 1970s, just as cities are being like totally howled out. Um, and so they have to take on these very sort of um, pro privatization policies and logics. Um, so like Adolph Reed calls um, black political leadership and neoliberalism as like the fraternal twins of the 1970s. And so they both came up at the same time in very sort of different trajectories. Um, and you see that even still, um, there's certainly been like a shift in increased black women leadership, whether it's at the mayoral level at other um, sort of appointed or authority um, or even sort of state level politics. And again, it's that tight sort of like rock in a hard place of being um, wanting to advocate for more sort of broader social welfare and public benefit for black women, but also having to, you know, campaign and run on a platform that's amenable to reelection to actually get things done. Um, so you see this sort of conservative layer um, that makes it really hard to navigate. Um, there have been exceptions to that, right? One could argue that Gaudier is doing something where she's like taking developer money, but like doing like anti-developer policy. Um, but who knows how sustainable that can be. But certainly, um, you know, the idea of like anti-blackness and, and poverty in the city, um, it's hard to escape. And so I think it comes out even in sort of these like pro-public benefit um, 
speeches and, and policies, you'll still going, you're still going to see a lot of that like anti-blackness emerge, um, discussions of family structure, discussions of, you know, single parents and bootstraps. And so, again, that's something that's um, fully one or the other, but you see them kind of navigate that fine line where they're advocating for um, better housing for black women, but also, you know, accusing them of destroying intentionally their communities. So, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping more people write about it. <laughs> it's kind of not an enjoyable thing to interrogate. Fran? Yeah, um, a lot of it was just like good timing. And so you see like tenant politics, and I argue we could possibly be in another moment where it's like the housing market is unstable, people don't have money, <laughs> people are renting again, and like being a renter comes with a host of problems that are pretty shared, right? Whether it's like um, upper, you know, luxury housing or or not, if you have a negligent landlord, which most of them are because they own so much property, you know, a lot of them can own a lot of property, um, then it, it's, it's possible to organize on broader um, geographies. And so um, in the 1970s, we see a lot of like um, great political power from tenants. They're, you know, not just organizing in the tenant association, they've got like local chapters of the National Tenants Organization. They've got um, local chapters of Tenants United for Fairness, and they're all kind of attacking from different angles. Um, but the concessions are usually like pretty small relative to the cost of the organizing, right? So like we're not paying rent for nine months, so we're maybe not getting maintenance for nine months, only for like there to be a new like lease procedure or like some eviction protections, right? Um, they're seeing like greater representation with like access to legal aid lawyers um, to get more due process, but um, that it, that's just like prolonging their eviction, for example, or there's maybe not enough legal aid lawyers to address the, the vast needs. And so the, the gains were like, not these like revolutionary shifts, but they were like addressing and humanizing a lot of the policies um, and making like very small interventions. But they, um, you know, there was no like rent control that was implemented in Georgia. And it's still like a really like anti-renters market for sure. Um, and so there were protections, of course, they were able to get through public housing policy at the federal and state level, but that sort of disappeared once public housing disappeared. And so that to me was like one of the greatest losses was that they were sort of charting a path for protections um, and keeping that like class of rental housing well protected for tenants' rights. Um, but it was, it's still really, really difficult to get those sorts of policies spread throughout a state like Georgia. Landis, then Vincent. So um, the emergence of Pope Six happens, happens a, a little earlier, but about the same time uh, as the crime bill um, in, in Washington. And in both cases, you see both the national uh, black leadership and um, the leadership of in many cases, local organizations, leadership, primarily men, not Tyler, but primarily men, mm -hmm. endorsing both, both of these ideas, endorsing the idea that, we, you know, we have to lock up yeah. both, the super predators and that we have to um, replace uh, particularly high-rise public housing with a mixed income, um, primarily mixed income, low, lower rise, more community-like housing. Mm -hmm. So, my question is, um, why were were these were these uh, why did these why did they endorse these ideas mm -hmm. um, so clearly? Uh, was it because they were co-opted? Um, mm -hmm. Because they didn't understand the actual lived experiences of the people, often women, in mm -hmm. public housing, 
because they didn't anticipate the where the narrative would lead mm-hmm. in mass incarceration or in the case of a lot of displacement. Mm-hmm. Or what, what's your take on why these two parallel things happened the way they did? Mm-hmm. Where, again, we forget, but pretty clearly, the African American policy leadership of the country endorsed both of these ideas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. I like have a whole paper on this, dude. Because, <laughs> like, no, like, we looked at um, public housing demolition over, like, 20 years in different cities, and we looked at cities that had, like, long-standing black leadership, and they were more likely to demolish public housing that was predominantly black um, and less likely to redevelop it as public housing units, more likely to develop it as private units. Um, and I think that's just, like, more evidence of, of hollow prize but also sort of like the endurance of respectability politics in like black political leadership that, um, you know, there's this idea from the 90s of linked fate, right? Um, that we all, all black people are linked, right? All of our fates are linked. And so we need to like raise up the lowest classes so that the upper classes can sort of maintain their upper classiness. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think there's, yes, definitely a disconnect between like actually knowing poor people, um, which I think is really important to like have a humanized perspective of poverty and not like what you see on the news as being your only representation. Um, But also the kind of strength of like um, the listening sessions and venues where they engage with um, their constituents. So predominantly churches and other sort of conservative or elderly spaces um, where the fear of crime is real. Um, and the conditions of public housing are not great. And these seem like they're going to be things that both work to, one, improve the lives of people who live there, but two, to allow for their cities and their districts to be more amenable to investment and capital. Um, A lot of these solutions are ways to bring in redevelopment, right? You have a city like Gary or you have a city like Newark Um, Clearing public housing is a way of sort of saying that they're getting the state out of the way, that they're allowing for capital to come in. And so I think for black leadership, yes, it was that like anti-blackness and anti-poverty conflation that I talked a bit about earlier. Um, The distance between them and the lived experience of those who live in poverty, um, but also them thinking that this was going to be a win-win. So like, I don't know, like surely no one can like imagine what Hope 6 and the crime bill were going to bring about. Um, but thinking like, this, is, you know, people in my district feel unsafe. <laughs> they want better investment in housing. This is a way to invest in housing and everyone wins. But in Atlanta in particular, no one knew that it was gonna take 20 plus years to demolish all that housing. And that the housing market would change so much that it didn't become feasible to redevelop it as public housing. So there was like timing and there were like all of these other contributing factors as well. But definitely the longer you had black leadership, the more likely you were to demolish public housing and redevelop less of it. Um, so I have a question and I'm not sure where I'm going to pull you up before I go up. So, go for it. Uh, you can be articulated. Oh God. So, so I'm thinking particularly <laughs> Presented on the picture of uh, university city homes, right? This mm-hmm. is, you know, and, uh, and it got me thinking, you know, in the book, you talk a lot about public housing and, and it's creating spaces, right? For political participation and action. You clearly saw the movement towards the private sector development of subsidized housing, away from public housing and subsidized housing. Mm-hmm. So it does not just this current model, but it's just built on public private partnerships, and by virtue of doing that, taking it out of the public sector in some ways, right? Mm-hmm. In many ways, does it create similar spaces for political participation and engagement? Or is it endemic to like this partnership structure that is inherently structured, right? And particularly in this current moment, like you said, with you know something going on, the out out going on just like here, right? Yeah. Um, how do we how do we think of that moment of political engagement and participation in the context of some of the changes going on? Yeah, what I like about public housing is like how much is required, right? You have like you have to do these. You have to have a space for your tenant association to meet. You have to fund them. Bless you. You have to like, you know, do these, you know, create these actual spaces. You have this like very kind of like 
easy structure, right? This is your housing manager. This is your, you know, executive director of the housing authority. That's your board. That's your regional HUD. All of that is super clear. Um, it's not clear with, um, you know, what's going on up the street. They don't know who they sold it to. They don't, they had a meeting the other week that was like nothing, right? It was all by the book, but like not by the book at all, very last minute. Um, and there's, you know, once that land is redeveloped, even if there is some public housing or some subsidized units there, um, and I hear this a lot from tenant organizers across the country, they're like, how is it that they, these landlords get public money and they have no like accountability whatsoever? Like they have no sort of like, you know, they've got some like building codes, they've got, you know, an outlet on every wall, they've got things that they have to do if they want to maintain that unit as a section eight unit, but they really don't have to have any sort of accountability or provide any of that structure or programming or social service wraparounds that like federally funded and built um, public housing developments did. Um, so to me, that's the like loss is that loss of public transparency, accountability and like right. Um, that is like the most horrible thing. Um, and again, as we see like more people are becoming renters and like the weakening of these tenants rights, it's like disaster. Oh, look at the time. <laughs> oh man, let's end on that high note, come on. <laughs> It's almost seven. Are there? Oh, Matt has a question. Okay. <laughs> um, congratulations. Thanks, Ren. Um, I'm really curious about how this idea of the Black Mecca persists mm -hmm. with this evidence that you're pointing to of an erasure of working class Black people from this so called Black metropolis um, of Atlanta. And I guess I'm wondering. You know, how does it persist, and is it is is it somehow? Uh, is your work showing some way that the cost of Mecca is the sort of you know abscondment or just the the, the discardment of working class people? Um, that's one kind of thing I'm I'm wrestling with with mm -hmm. what your work is showing, um, and 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 I'm thinking about what you were saying earlier about linked fate mm -hmm. and how linked fate as a concept um, in some ways relies on this sort of hierarchy that you're pointing to. Mm -hmm. I didn't ever read, I never read that idea that way, so I'm very, I'm actually kind of shocked that that's how you're interpreting the idea, but I want to, I want to hear more about this intra-racial sort of relationships you're pointing to. And the last thing I guess I'm sitting with is that you pointed out in one of your slides that um, there was a lot of, uh, well, multiple slides, really, that there's a lot of organizing from these, these tenants to get the same rights that other white public housing residents were getting. And so I guess I'm just curious, thinking about all the things that different public housing people did to, you know, um, limit the, the, the ability of families, white families, to have two-parent households, all these things. How are we seeing a, a sort of resurgence of, of a real sort of public housing that dignifies black people and doesn't, you know, cut against this idea of a mecca? Mm -hmm. um, cool. Great question. Um, okay, the mecca question, I don't know. Why does it persist? I guess because it's like a good, um, you know, with... Black politics very broadly, there has like there's this like arc justice spending, right? Yeah. Um, so it's like, of course, Atlanta is the me mecca, right? Like, look at all those like black mayors down there. Look at all those big houses. Like, like they're crushing it. <laughs> <laughs> and so like they think the same of like DC. You know, like these are areas where it's like it's not Newark, right? It's like these are areas where you have black leadership and you've got a strong black middle class and everything's good, right? you know, other data be damned. Um, and so I think it persists because I think it, it works, right? Like, I think it's something that's always been like very useful for black people to have, right? Is this idea that you put in this work, you do this, like this is like the ultimate goal for you, right? To, to live in this type of place and create these places for yourselves. The strong black institutions of HBCUs, finances be damned, right? And so people like are okay to, to see that like 
double narrative um, and erase a lot of the harms that come out of those great HBCUs or mm -hmm. in the city of Atlanta, right? Um, and I think that's something that's always, I think that's kind of like colorblind, right? This is just something that like, we don't mind erasing the experience of the poor and the vulnerable if they serve to make a good example of something. There's like a whole kerfuffle at Harvard right now, right? Over this professor who harms so many people and you have all these like other big name Harvard professors coming out and saying, oh, well, he's my friend. <laughs> oh, well, he's been nice to me, right? And that's like how it kind of keeps going. Um, so that's, I'm gonna table that. But Maurice Hobson writes about this. He writes about like, the black Mecca and kind of like the politics of race and class in Atlanta. And um, Danielle Wiggins is also writing about Maynard Jackson's um, mayoral years and kind of how that kind of shaped, again, this sort of narrative um, around the black Mecca. Um, what was the second part of your question? I'm sorry. Oh, just how, how does, how does, how do, how do we realize that sort of public housing that doesn't, oh. you know, more or less, um, reduce the dignity of working class people and, and, and so on. Yeah. This is like what people say with like universal vouchers. Like you kind of have to like, instead of trying to figure out how to save this for the people who need it the most and who are the people who need it the most, it's like this sort of deserving group versus that one. Um, people don't like, there's this idea that like the poverty will go away. And I think like that's like part of the public housing program overall is that like you have this public housing and like you're out of poverty and that's it, poverty's over, right? Um, and it doesn't like deal with the realities of poverty, the like intergenerationalness of poverty, the sort of like rise and fall of it, how it changes over one's lifetime. There's just like no like acknowledgement of that. Um, and so until we kind of like really deal with what poverty is, like we can't really have effective anti-poverty policy. Like they're just now saying like, maybe we should give poor people money. Like what? <laughs> like it's just so like, what? Like, yeah, that's a good idea. But like people don't like, wow, what if they like got on the bus for free so they could get to work on time? Like, yes, like now you're getting it. <laughs> daycare, food, like medicine, like all of these very basic ideas, people like rediscover every five years. Um, so yeah, I think that's like when we actually realize that poverty is like endemic to our society and it's not this like individual, oh, you like don't know, oh, that's the microphone, sorry. Oh, you don't know, you know, how to live. Um, I think we'll have like effective public housing or just housing. I don't know. I'm an idealist. Okay. Yeah. That seemed like a good note. To that's another up note, right? Thank I guess. You so much. Thank welcome. you. I know, right? Kind of, kind of running for Senate, so. Congratulations. Thank you all. Have a good night.